Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of thy love, leading onward, leading homeward to thy glorious rest above. All right. If you guys would join me in Luke 11 today, we're going to be going through one of Jesus' exorcisms, and it's amazing how many times Luke really accentuates these exorcisms as important to Jesus' ministry, and important to um, really the impact and the meaning of Jesus' work and what his messiahship really means. I titled this Overcoming Satan, of course, because He's done this once, he's done this multiple times in the the narrative of Luke. And here we're seeing how Jesus is constantly assaulting the powers of darkness. And of course, given uh, this week's headlines, the real question is, what does understanding Jesus' rule over the world and over world history, um, how does that come to bear on modern uh, current events and, and really on the darkness that we presently see? Jesus' ministry of exorcism is a constant reminder that Jesus was taking the fight to the powers of darkness directly. Here's in many other accounts, Jesus teaches that the presence of his kingdom is here, evidenced in overcoming Satan in this passage. Uh, Satan uh, has been resisted in the temptation. Satan has been cast down from heaven through the obedience of his people in a previous verse. Uh, Satan's demons are constantly subject to Jesus with no hope of reprisal or fighting back. And Jesus is an aggressor to the kingdom of darkness in all these stories. And the cosmic battle between God and the devil is on display in many of these stories where Jesus is the uncontested victor every time. We see these points clearly laid out and we struggle to understand what this means for today. When we see headlines that we do, Satan clearly has a degree of power today. So what does Jesus' exorcisms and the cosmic battles that we see in the gospel narratives uh, mean in light of today's evils? Um, Is Satan really beaten? Does he still hold authority or sway? Is Jesus unfinished or is he still fighting for authority? These questions, in a sense, in some ways go beyond our text, but in many ways this is just about the perfect text that we could have landed on for all the things that we're um, dealing with and seeing today. So I'll take a little drink here and then we'll begin reading. Join me in Luke eleven fourteen. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the, re- the ruler of demons. Others to test him were demanding a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? But you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when somebody stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away from him his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Um, and let's, let's stop there, but we're going to end up going all the way up to 28. Jesus here has been doing... Uh, Uh, you know, more of his good and amazing works, his miraculous works before the crowd. Verse 14 really um, opens, showing us again, and just reconfirming as a touchstone, Jesus's popularity before the crowds is ever growing. He's not doing these these things in secret. These are publicly attested events. um, And uh, really, 
the thing that we can sort of pull just briefly from verse 14 is that this man's identity was co-opted with the devil's identity that had consumed him. This man had gone mute because it was a mute spirit within him. Um, and really upon his healing, Jesus restores his personhood and his voice. When Jesus heals us, we receive back our ability to live as he intended us. Satan's power over our lives can restrict us from living the complete human experience, the complete experience that God had destined for us. And only under God's control can one truly be the authentic self that Christ created you to be. Jesus gives this man back his voice. He's able to express himself. Um, the creator knows who you were intended to be. And Jesus releases this man from bondage to be that man. He's given him back his freedom and his personal autonomy on the other side of this cleansing. And in verse 15, uh, we see the, the crowd's reaction. Um, and, and it's sort of, I guess, 16, 15 and 16 together both show you sort of two separate reactions, two separate accusations uh, leveled against Jesus for this good deed. Now, here it's an unnamed protagonist. Luke has sort of dropped the accusation against the Pharisees. Um, of course, in other gospel accounts, we know it was the Pharisees. But here it's just sort of the general crowd, the attitude of the crowd. Um, it says in verse 15, But some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. This is an insult, of course. Uh, the question is not on whether or not the exorcism happened or whether or not this was something that truly took place. The question is the power um, or the method of the miracle, not the miracle itself. This accusation um, is that Jesus is spiritually empowered, yes, but the power and the authority of his exorcisms that he does is actually demonic. The idea may be that to have mastery over that domain, you must have experience with it. You must have uh, a knowledge of its inner workings or maybe have a man on the inside to, to have your sway. Imagine the accusation leveled against you that if you help somebody dealing with addiction that, well, it takes one to know one, so you must deal with addiction. Um, or if you are trying to counsel a friend who's had an affair and they're, they've decided to stay together that you must, you must know a little bit about that. You know, you must have had an affair or must be willing to have an affair too. This is um, disparaging one's character for doing a good deed, right? The assumption being made here is that Jesus' control over this domain makes him one of them or perhaps in league with the prince or the ruler among them. They are calling Jesus deeply evil for doing a lot of good. What does this say about, you know, the hearts of the people challenging him? And in verse 16, you see uh, a similarly uh, offensive but maybe more subtle accusation here. In 16, we see... Um, that there is a separate request for a sign from heaven, undermining the credibility of Jesus. They ask him, uh, in verse 16, others, to test him, were demanding from him a sign from heaven. Jesus uh, here is really, his credibility is, under, is being undermined. Uh, this is seemingly less offensive, but it suggests that the exercise of, the exorcism by itself is not good enough proof. Yeah, you healed this demonic, the op oppressed man, but... You know, show us a, an outside verification that this is credibly uh, power from heaven. Um, you know, they're really saying that Jesus cannot credibly work on God's behalf or make claims about God on his own behalf, that he must have outside verification. This, uh, you know, a sign from heaven would be helpful. Um, this betrays a heart of unbelief, right? We ask God to prove himself when we ask questions, um, and then when those questions are answered, sometimes we invent even more questions. It wasn't something that truly was bothering us, but now that you've sort of filled up my curiosity, well, let me invent another reason why I can't be having faith in Jesus. Some people simply have a bias against Jesus or against faith, uh, and it's disguised as critical thinking or just being a reasonable person. Um, but really, it's, it's to the end of self-promotion and, and ultimately self-sufficiency and a life without credibility, or not credibility, accountability. The honest skeptic will have faith on the other side of reason, when reason has done its work. You'll ask your questions. You'll search the scriptures. You'll test, um, you know, Christ's claims against your experience in this life and whether or not it's consistently held throughout the Bible. You'll see if the Bible is a contradictory message or not. And then on the far side of that reason, you'll have faith. You'll say, I've had enough of my questions answered, and it doesn't mean that all of my questions are answered or that there's not 
still room for faith, but I'm willing to plant my flag. The insincere skeptic will never plant their flag, no matter the answers, until there is exhaustive proof they're not willing to make that leap and stand on faith in support of their Savior. Some people here, as seen here, witness miracles, and it's not enough for them to, to believe. When we're reminded of Hebrews 11, right? That without faith, I think it's 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please God because you must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So Jesus here is being undermined in, in two places. First of all, his credibility to make his own claims and do good on behalf of his father. And secondly, he's being uh, accused of being demonic, demonically empowered to do um, these miracles. In verse 17, Jesus knows their thoughts. It says, but he knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste and the house divided against itself falls. If Satan is also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For if you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebul, uh, for you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebul. Jesus points to the flaws in their argument. He opens basically by saying that Satan's influence on earth um, is cohesive. He's, it's not this scattered movement of random evil. Satan is influencing on a spiritual level his kingdom inside uh, our domain, right? Satan's influence on earth is characterized as a kingdom. Just like I've been arguing that Jesus is saying that his kingdom has come and is present, spiritually speaking, um, and, and sort of trying to break into this domain, it's the same for Satan's kingdom. A spiritual kingdom of darkness is exercising its influence on this earth. The movement of Satan is cohesive and a unified movement of evil across this domain and imposed upon, across his domain and imposed upon our domain. We see that he's saying it's sort of unrealistic that you'd think that Satan would campaign against himself. First of all, that's the first flaw in their argument. Satan, he's not campaigning against himself. He has a cohesive movement and it's against me. In verse 19, it says, and if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. Jesus then points to the inconsistency in their logic and their own personal practice. He's probably appealing to their own belief in the possibility of exorcisms. There's not a lot of historical evidence about Jewish exorcists at this time, but we know that, you know, a couple of random, not random, but small stories, and we definitely know of Greek and Roman uh, belief in exorcisms. Uh, but basically, he's saying, in effect, can there be any credible exorcism carried out on behalf of God? Because if you're saying that all exorcisms are demonic, then you're basically removing any possibility that Satan's kingdom can be overthrown. Um, is their kingdom untouchable? Untouchable by your? Uh, uh, is is their kingdom untouchable at all? Or do your ex, uh, exorcists cast out demons um, with the same power of God that I'm claiming to use? So there's an inconsistency in their logic as he defends himself. So he's attacked their argument, but now he's going to sort of say, move from the negative to the positive and say, well, your, your, your argument's flawed, but here's what's really going on. And in verse 20, he says, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The finger of God, what is that? Well, this is um, interesting because there's at least three uh, usage, usages of this in the Old Testament that I looked up. The one that stands out the most is that um, Aaron and Moses, when they were having a showdown with Pharaoh's magicians, uh, Aaron and Moses had done two miracles, and the third miracle that uh, they did, the, the magicians couldn't replicate. They had turned the, the, dust, the dust into gnats, and when the magicians couldn't replicate it, they sort of had an aside with Pharaoh and said, this is the finger of God, like, we can't fake this one. There's, there's an outside power here at work. God himself is moving, and, and we should be terrified, right? Um, the finger of God harkens back to this test by Aaron and Moses where um, God's work was uh, distinct and credible and powerful. God was reaching his hand into human history and having his way. And what happened, of course, was that Pharaoh's heart was still hardened. This may be a warning against the hard-hearted in their midst at this moment who refuse to believe this sign of exorcism. Jesus is saying that I've done this good thing and it's the distinct work of my father. It's undeniable. 
And for you to deny it puts you in a bad light. It draws into question who your allegiance really is to. Jesus exercises God's spiritual rule on earth too. Just like Satan is trying to exercise his spiritual rule through his kingdom, Jesus is bringing in God's kingdom and trying to exercise that spiritual rule on earth. This kingdom rule uh, is upon you. This is present in the power and the work of Jesus in instances like this. This is yet another verse on the presence of the kingdom available in Jesus today, day, and I'd argue available still through his movement today. And so then he goes in, and after making this statement about the presence of God and his encroaching power on the powers of darkness, he, he has verse 21 and 22 with a, a small parable. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards against his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when a str- uh, someone stronger, then he attacks him and overpowers him. He takes it a- a- away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. So we're in a small parable here. Who's the first strong man in verse 21? It has to be Satan, right? Satan is the strong man, equipped to defend his house, his kingdom, He's wearing armor. He's armed and dangerous. And uh, up till now, he's been undisturbed. Up till now, he's been undisturbed. But who is the stronger man in verse 22? Jesus is the stronger man. Jesus assaults this man's house and plunders it. This is a really cool verse for showing Jesus' self-conception of his own spiritual power. But when somebody stronger than he attacks and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. This means that Jesus uses, uh, the means that Jesus uses to excise demons is frontal assault. Full on frontal assault. Jesus isn't doing any covert ops here. He is assaulting the man of the house and overpowering him. Then he goes and plunders his belongings. Jesus has disrobed and pilfered the man, right? The things that he had relied on, this armor, Jesus beats him, takes it off of him, and distributes it. He distributes the goods. This is a complete overthrow of this man and his house. This is humiliation. Jesus diminishes this person, this man, this strong man, and his possessions. This means that Jesus is attacking the actual source of evil that we see still at work today. Jesus stares down his opponent and demolishes him. The people he saves is the plunder that he steals from these homes, right? The people he saves is the plunder that he distributes after brutalizing Satan and pilfering his kingdom. Jesus' answer really delineates two things for us. He is not on the side of demons. He's a fierce opponent to the kingdom of Satan. And second, Jesus assaults this kingdom as a sovereign power and not as a subservient power. He is accused of being empowered by the prince of darkness, this, this prince of demons, uh, Beelzebul. And this is patently false. He assaults the opposing master and does it as the greater and ultimate power um, with no reference to a strength outside of himself. So who could resist the power of the accuser of himself, of Satan himself? Well, 24 implicitly is going to answer this question. In verse 24, um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Verse 23, uh, says, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Jesus is the man um, that we must be for or against. There's no neutral position. To deny him is to be on the side of Satan. You will scatter with him. But to be with him is to be on the side of who? Could a human make this claim? Could a man make this claim? This is what theologians have called implicit Christology. Right? Implicitly speaking, a human being or just simply a prophet would not make such a claim. But to be against Jesus, um, he is, who is not with me is against me, and he, who is, uh, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Jesus is saying that you, may, you must pick a side, and that side is going to be determined on the side that you take with him. To be on his side is to be the, on the side of the one who is greater than Satan. Who else? but the Lord. Jesus gathers his people and Satan tries to scatter them. This is really something that we can understand on a cosmic level even today. How is kingdom power distributed by Jesus? Jesus is gathering his people and Satan is trying to scatter them. God's kingdom is a power 
uh, it, God's kingdom power is exerted on gathering people. He's plundering the kingdom of Satan as he wins his people back to himself. When we contextualize this kingdom as upon them, what is he doing? He's assaulting the force of evil at its source. And this is really important because this highlights that God is a personal God. When he wins back his creation from evil, he isn't assaulting political powers to redeem the world and its governments. He isn't assaulting collapsed political systems or uh, social systems to restore justice to certain social classes or groups of people. He is assaulting demonic forces at their source to pillage back his people one person at a time. He won't have his people back to him in partial or steps or in pragmatism. He isn't restoring his morality to the world order or his preferred form of government. He wins the whole person back. And how does he do so? By robbing the other kingdom and bringing them into his kingdom directly. And I think this is wonderful and beautiful as we think about what this means for Jesus' present rule. And we'll continue to develop this point, but this is still what's happening today. This is still how Jesus is empowering his church to act and, and work. Is let's, let's go plunder the evil kingdom. And, and in the midst of their limited power, let's go save some of them and rob back a couple more souls and win them, win them back for his kingdom. Let's, let's get them from the power of darkness and snatch them from the fire and bring them into his glorious light. Now, we haven't read 24 through 26 yet, but let's do so. It says, When the unclean spirit goes out from a man, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest and not finding any. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they go and live there. And the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. 24 through 26 can seem like a weird um, break, in a sense, of, the flow of this argument. But Jesus is, is sort of saying, well, what's the implications of what I've told you? You are not better off if you were healed, if you have not been converted into the new kingdom. He's gonna develop this new thought here that uh, if you are not indwelt and guarded by the better master, the oppression that you have been rescued from as you receive the healing and not the healer, not the savior, it leaves you vulnerable to a worse oppression. This is a striking point and important for us to realize for our day as well. That Jesus may be powerful to overthrow demonic forces, but it's the presence of his kingdom um, has not wiped out the presence of the opposing authority, the opposing but limited authority of evil. It's not negated either the necessity of the individual to respond to salvation and accept it for themselves. We want a world where there's no evil, And we refuse to believe in a God who would allow such things to happen. And the irony is that Jesus has always offered the power to overthrow evil and its rule on this earth. Um, And and the world would be better off for it. But we actually prefer, as a world collectively, we prefer to be occupied by powers of darkness rather than let Jesus rule. Our society has found itself in a post-Christian era. If people minimize Jesus to just a good teacher, and then they take his kingdom to just mean basically being a good person and having some social reforms, then largely the world thinks that it's gotten everything it needs in, um, out of Christianity. It was a useful delusion. Um, you know, we got our hospitals from Christians, and we got our social programs from Christians, and Christianity has increased uh, global literacy. It's spread freedoms and overthrown tyranny. It's fed many people and ended all kinds of historical evils. But we've had enough. We, we, we'll take those principles, we'll ditch the Savior, and we'll move on. And yet here we are, no better off for all our advancements in technology and, and advancements in human philosophy. Um, all this advancement that we might have had from Christianity to overthrow evil has failed to keep it out because we failed to let Christ rule. The 20th century was the bloodiest century in all of human history. You can look up the numbers and see how many people died at the hands of Nazism and communism and all sorts of terrible other evils. And I've heard estimates that there was more people that died in the 20th century that had ever died in the previous history of the world. I mean, it's just crazy. The 21st century is barely rolling. And look at the evils that we can invent and justify. The world isn't better off if Jesus has healed parts of it and they have refused him as savior. It's only better off 
when people enter the kingdom of God and allow the God-man to rule in their hearts. The, the previous state of the man becomes worse than the first. If we've accepted the good things that we can get from Jesus and from his movement and refused to let the stronger man settle in and rule, we will suffer. We will, we will, have worse, we will be worse off than we were before. 27, Jesus um, wraps up this story with the final call to action here. It says, while Jesus was saying these things, one woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and blessed are the breasts, uh, breasts that, uh, at which you nursed. And in 28, he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. If Jesus' mother was blessed by association, how much more are those of us who are blessed, who follow him in word and deed, who allow that strong man, the stronger man, to come in, beat up the bad guy, set the house in order, and stay and rule and protect our lives and our hearts? How much better are we for hearing the word of God and doing it? This is what it means to be in the kingdom today. The kingdom today, of course, I've, I've mentioned this before, and it's not me harping on it, it's Luke, right? Just remember this is Luke harping on this. There's a present and a future aspect of this kingdom. It's related really to two things. There's this aspect of it that it's soteriological, which means uh, regarding salvation, that when you're saved, you enter the kingdom of God. And so the church is a partial representation of this kingdom, but it's not the kingdom in its totality. There's an eschatological, an end time, sort of a grand view, a cosmic view of what this kingdom means. So yes, we represent the kingdom of God on earth today. And how does this kingdom authority against the cosmic of for, uh, uh, forces of evil really pan out for us? What does this mean? Well, Jesus has constantly practiced his kingdom authority against the cosmic forces of evil. Jesus is never subjecting humanity to his unstoppable, uh, unstoppable might like he does the power of evil. He has the authority to just boss around demons and he doesn't do this to people. This is something that was true then and remains true today. And so this helps us understand why the world is still in its state. If Jesus can stare down Satan, um, what does it say when, about God's will when he doesn't use this power to stare down earthly evil, whose limited strength and authority is only a shadow of the force that empowers it? Jesus is attacking evil at its source. And the presence in injustice and terror and oppression um, and the individual and political evils that we constantly see threatening uh, the world and its people is not a threatened, uh, does not threaten uh, Jesus' mission to secure his people. Jesus and his kingdom are interested in human souls. Human systems be damned, honestly. The corrupt powers in leadership of this day uh, have not hampered the spread of Christ's church. His mission marches on in every era of human history and in every context of human culture. Jesus saw his kingdom as incredibly focused on the people who would be his, and they were marked as his citizens no matter what they faced because they were already stripped out of the hands of their ultimate enemy, Satan. Jesus chose to redeem his people and not this world. We lament the decline of civilization and morals and family values and much more, and that's fine. But I don't think that Jesus sheds tears for those things. His kingdom at hand, uh, his kingdom is at hand, and it lives in the lives of those of us who are saved. His government has not ended, as he rules in the hearts of his people. And his eschatological kingdom that will come, and we're hoping for it to come, that we're hoping and know will be consummated and complete, will not be tarnished by the evils that his saints have to live through today. Christ is presently king in two ways. He's the cosmic ruler over all creation. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 20 through 28, I don't have time to go into it today, it talks about how at the ascension, Jesus received this rulership as cosmic king. He sits at the right hand of God, and at the end of days, he will give that cosmic kingship back to the Father um, so that God can be all in all. And it's a beautiful verse, and there's lots of implications to it, but temporarily, Jesus has been awarded his cosmic kingship Presently, over all of human history, over all things, as a reward for being the obedient son. And so this rule of creation is something um, that Jesus has, 
And he is also the mediatorial ruler of his covenant, Peter, uh, covenant people. He mediates, right? He mediates this rule um, between the people who are the church, the people who have accepted salvation, um, and he mediates for them to the Father, the cosmic rulership of the Father. He's been given both for now, right? But the kingdom of God uh, that the, the church really represents, um, it's not going to go away. It's not limited but it's not going to go away. And so Jesus, when he practices his cosmic rule, I think I maybe lost some people, but let's focus on this part. When he practices his cosmic rule today, um, it's not to the benefit of this world or its inhabitants. Jesus is exercising his cosmic rule to the ends of increasing and completing the gathering, the ingathering of his eschatological kingdom. Jesus directs human history and he allows evil to happen to the benefit of his bride, the church. And he allows evil to happen for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, for God to be good and worthy of worship, he must allow us to be free actors and to worship him voluntarily. It is inevitable that he has uh, let us be free people, and because of that, it's inevitable that we will have our own self-inflicted suffering. Um, to allow freedom is to allow the possibility of evil. To exist as free creatures, honestly, is to suffer, at this moment at least. But that existence is a blessing nonetheless. And so that's why we see evil, of course, but we still recognize that God is in, is in sovereign control. The powers of darkness and the kingdom of evil only get its way when God gets his way. Jesus is stronger than Satan. They are not co-equal powers. Jesus is never on the ropes and Satan never has the upper hand. Presently, Satan is given limited authority and really a subservient power, but it's not a contest. The miraculous wonder of God's sovereignty is that he can do evil Sorry, he can do good even when evil is allowed to transpire. Um, it's not even just in spite of evil happening, but sometimes God's goodness can happen through evil. Satan is a subservient power, and so in a sense, being created himself, now be careful here, Satan can be considered God's Satan. God doesn't, uh, does not love Satan or his kingdom. He's not in, uh, in favor of it, but God allows Satan to work to bring about his own destruction and God's ultimate victory. The perfect and most beautiful example of this is the cross. Who got their way in the cross? Did Satan get his way in the cross or did God get his way in the cross? The answer is yes to both. Satan got his way in the short term. He orchestrated the events of the cross and who chose the cross, who volunteered for the cross, who planned for the cross? Jesus himself submitted to the cross voluntarily and God planned for the cross, for the redemption of all people. So we're thinking pretty deeply and pretty theologically here, but Satan only gets his way when God gets his way. And so how can this be? We must admit that most of us are most deeply tested in our love for God when we're faced with his sovereignty, right? When we realize um, that God is completely personal and, and self-motivated apart from our own value structures and understanding, um, we immediately recoil. This is something that gets to our sinful nature at its most basic. It's not trusting in God's goodness in favor of our own. God is good and perfectly and entirely other from us. We could never fully understand who God is on this side of salvation. What we must understand on this side of the salvation is that we have to have faith that God can do good for his people that we could never comprehend or imagine. How can a good God allow evil? We must trust that in many ways God can only bring about the ultimate good, the best good, the, the most good, through means we could never understand, even when evil has its way. He's perfect and all-powerful and all-knowing. And so, as evil has its battles won, it's, what it wins is really its ultimate defeat, as Jesus directs human history. We might not understand it, but I know this is how God works. So, Jesus directs history from the right hand of the Father to win human souls from this kingdom, out of the powers of darkness, through the hell that we create, and the powers of Satan at work in our present history. Jesus plucks each of us out of destruction, and each of us is a special operation, a special rescue mission from himself, by himself, uh, from himself, to, I guess, to, to his own kingdom, right? Jesus can redeem, came to redeem his church, his covenant people to himself, and the rest he plans to upend, this house is still being plundered by Christ. 
He defeats evil and allows it as an opportunity to rescue more people. So why the present crisis? Well, I don't know all the reasons why, but there will be some people that will be saved as a result of the evil, the honest atrocities that are happening in Israel. Some people will be saved. And so, at least partially, that is why. So then how does Jesus rule, and why does Jesus rule as our mediatorial king? It said in our verse today, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Jesus sets his house in order and rules it in strength. He calls us to impose his government as a resistance movement on earth. His church is a method that he rules um, this earth through the regular means of our daily obedience. As a matter of our worship, our discipleship, our walk of faith, just in our daily obedience to listening to the word of God, we allow that stronger man to set our house in order and keep it strong and keep it safe. Imagine the mantle given to us. If we are an extension of that kingdom rule on earth, and that, that world is in constant turmoil, how should this inform our faith? How should this inform our pattern of lifestyle? How should this determine our identity or the importance of our calling? Is Christ king? Well, then act like a people. Like, act like his people, no matter how dark this world grows. Show them how, how good it could be, how good it ought to be. Um, and so often I feel like when we don't have an understanding of the present reality of the kingdom, even as we look forward to the future, if we, only, if we, if we don't take this to heart, that Christ is presently ruling in our lives, we can get so passive. We can act like items on a frigate, just sort of waiting for the Lord to come back. We've got a, a future destination until we can really, truly live our purpose, and that's just not the case. He won you back by violence. He bled and died to pillage you from Satan's kingdom. He overcame evil so that he could call you to himself, and he's called us to obey in the simplicity of living according to his word so that we can hold back the evil kingdom's reach on this earth and extend the heavenly kingdom's influence amidst the hell that we see. Christ is king, and this world is yet evil. Since creation, we have rejected him as king. No progress in technology or moral philosophy or human society has been able to stem the tide of bloodshed that we are capable of. Jesus rules as cosmic king, bringing about world history to gather the whole number of the elect back to himself. Then he will wipe the slate clean. He will judge the living and the dead. We will be established under his uncontested cosmic and ecclesial rule that will be eternal. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus has overthrown evil at his source, even as he allows it to linger for a little while longer until his redemption plan is complete. He is gathering those who are gathering with him. Those who are against him will scatter no more. Their free will and their limited authority and their power ended locked in eternal judgment, and the atrocities that their treasonous hearts committed, judged. So, let's be gracious and glad. Let's be glad for God's current rule. Let's understand and try to dwell on this as we watch world events and try to understand what does this mean for who I am and why have I been picked for this moment? Because God does have something to do through us and each of us, um, individually and as a congregation, What's our small place to fight back against evil and promote God's goodness and increase his kingdom influence on this earth, even as it's all passing away and we look forward to him finally conquering and overthrowing completely as he's promised to do. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the power of your son Jesus, for being the stronger man that would fight for his people. God, thank you for using your power not to overthrow or subdue us, but to overthrow and subdue the captor who is against us, um, who has with, uh, withheld us from you. God, thank you for gathering us to you. And as you continue to do that, Lord, um, please make us part of the harvest. We want to be a part of your work. Amen. Join me for one final song, if you'll stand. O oh, church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak 
can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given with shield of faith and belt of truth will stand against the devil's lies an army bold whose battle cry is love reaching out to those in darkness our call to war to love the captive soul but to rage against the captor with sword that makes the wounded whole we will fight with faith and valor when faced with trials on every side we know the outcome is secure and christ will have the prize for which he died an inheritance of nations come see the cross where love and mercy meet as the son of god is stricken then his foes lies crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen and as the stone is rolled away and christ emerges from the grave this victory march continues till the day every eye and heart shall see him Tell me you to pray to close this. Amen. Father God, I pray you would allow the church to arise, Father, to arise in the name of your Son, Father, and to hold it high, Father, for all to see, Father, in this world we live today. I pray, Father, you would make us bold in proclaiming the name of Christ, Father, the only way that we will see eternity. And I pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. Amen.